Have you heard about Mrs. Greville? A century ago, she was the society hostess who gave the parties that everyone wanted to be seen at. Her events were the talk of the celebrity press, everything from the royal guests right down to the kind of tablecloth she used. But there are some things about Mrs. Greville these cuttings don't tell us. Perhaps the most interesting things. A hundred years ago, the press were a little less intrusive over people's private lives. But if they'd done some digging about Ur Maggie, oh, what a story they'd have found. Because the woman who owned all this and turned it into the society playground of the 20th century, was the illegitimate daughter of a Scottish boarding house keeper and a brewer. Now, that's quite some journey, even by today's standards. A century ago, it was unheard of. So how did Maggie Greville pull off such a stunning, real-life Cinderella story? Her mother, Helen Anderson, ran a lodging house in the centre of Edinburgh. Mr Anderson worked as a porter in the brewery. Mr and Mrs Anderson weren't married, though, at least, not to each other. Mr Anderson is named as the father on Maggie's birth certificate, but it seems he was actually married to someone else. It's almost certain that Maggie's real daddy was this man. William McEwen, a self-made millionaire and the owner of the brewery where Mr Anderson worked. Why he didn't court Helen openly is a mystery, but it seems that behind closed doors, they got quite well acquainted. And Maggie was the result. When she was 21, William McEwen finally made an honest woman of her mother, and together they moved to London to escape the knowing glances and cutting remarks of Edinburgh society. Margaret found herself the potential heiress to a huge fortune. So with money, and position. What more could Maggie want? Well, how about a place in society like the one denied her in Edinburgh? Maggie set her sights on the very top, which meant playing hostess to the Prince of Wales. Quite how Maggie thought she had what it takes to climb to the top of the social ladder is anybody's guess. You'd imagine that the vulgarities of trade and the whiff of beer not to mention being born on the wrong side of the blanket, would be poison to any ambitions of that sort. But you'd be reckoning without two things Maggie had in barrel loads. Charm and cunning. She could read people like a book and if she thought they were useful to her, she'd move heaven and earth to add them to her set. But she needed one more thing to force open society's doors. A husband. Preferably an aristocratic one. Just six years after her mother married McEwen, Maggie became the wife of the Honourable Ronald Greville. Ronnie was a captain in the lifeguards, heir to a baronetcy, and a bit of a looker too. With him at her side, Maggie launched herself into London society, all guns blazing. Although women hadn't yet won the right to vote, the skillful society hostess who could attract the right guests and treat them to the best of everything would wield enormous influence. Maggie was a natural and took her place as one of the great hostesses of the early 20th century. She and Ronnie entertained in town at their opulent house in Mayfair, but the Edwardian era was the heyday of the weekend house party in the country. Royalty and politicians relished the chance to get away from town, to drink cocktails, shoot pheasants and, perhaps, indulge some other appetites. The Grevels rented Rygate Priory, not far from here, for their weekend parties, and proved a great success as hosts. The crown jewel in their set, as Maggie had always planned, was the Prince of Wales, soon to be Edward VII.
But Maggie, who directed every detail of these weekend productions, wanted more control over the scenery and settings. In 1906, McEwen bought Paulsden Lacey for her and Ronnie. Together they set about transforming the house with lavish decor and all the comforts of the grandest London hotels. In fact, they hired the designers of the Ritz to oversee the project. I want a room fit to entertain Maharajas in, she told them. She got it too. The couple's lavish ambitions also extended outdoors. These gardens were planned as part of a much larger, grander scheme. But before the work was finished, Ronnie was diagnosed with cancer and died a few months later. His death left a void in her life which would never be filled. In 1908, Maggie finally moved in to Paulsden Lacey. She kept her London house, but this was where her heart was. Her father would often come and stay, a widow, and a widower together. The Grevels never had children, so the laughter that would bring these rooms to life had to come from her friends. Perhaps that's why she was so drawn to the society gossips and scandal mongers of the 20s and 30s, people who loved to dish the dirt as much as she did. One of them, Chips Channon, said, there is no one on earth quite so skillfully malicious as old Maggie. The stage was set for the grandest part of Maggie's society career. She couldn't let the loss of her leading man prevent the show from going on. There's so much more to her story. This was a woman who took a role in her father's business empire and had the directors quaking in their boots at meetings here. But she never lost touch with her roots and was as happy playing matchmaker to her servants as she was to the aristocracy. I'd rather be a beeress than a peeress, she said. And then there were the lavish parties, the vicious gossip, the royal guests and their lovers who came to party the weekends away. Come and discover it for yourself and find out just how much champagne taste beer money can buy. <laughs> <laughs>